Welcome everyone to today's webinar. Uh, it might be evening or afternoon, depending on where you're calling from. Um, tonight, we're going to be talking about Indigenous perspectives on poverty reduction. I'd like to begin the webinar by acknowledging that we are meeting on Indigenous land. We are grateful for the opportunity to meet and we thank all the generations of Indigenous peoples who have taken care of this land. For those of us who identify as settlers, our recognition of the contributions and historic importance of Indigenous peoples must be clearly and overtly connected to our collective commitment to make the promise and the challenge of truth and reconciliation real in our communities. If we are to make meaningful progress to end poverty in Canada, Indigenous communities must be central to these conversations. I am pleased to introduce today's speakers today. We have our moderator today who's going to be hosting the conversation, Nikan Sinclair. He's an Anishinaabe writer, columnist with Winnipeg Free Press, head of Native Studies at the University of Manitoba, and was the 2018 columnist of the year for National Newspaper Awards. Leah Gazin is a member of Parliament for Winnipeg Centre. She is currently the NDP critic for children, families, and social development, as well as the deputy critic for immigration, refugees, and citizenship. Leah is a member of the Standing Committee on Human Resources, Skills, and Social Development, and the Status of the Persons with Disabilities, and the Standing Joint Committee on the Library of Parliament. Leslie Varley is the Executive Director of BC Association of Aboriginal Friendship Centres. She and her team focus on supporting the 25 member centers providing frontline services to Indigenous peoples. As an Indigenous advocate, she has had roles in both provincial and federal governments and within and for Indigenous community. Natasha Beattie is a policy analyst at the Assembly of First Nations, a national advocacy organization representing First Nation citizens in Canada. Natasha has recently co-authored the report Towards Justice, Tackling Indigenous Child Poverty in Canada. Welcome to all of our speakers today. Uh, we're looking forward to a really fruitful conversation and gaining some amazing insights and really important insights into uh, Indigenous poverty and what it's going to take to end poverty in Canada. So I'm going to start with Negan, who will set the stage and lead the conversation today. Over to you, Negan. See, I did the famous moot. I did the famous mistake already, where I was on mute. So bonjour, everybody. Uh, my name is Negan Sinclair. Bonjour, de mes magadouk. Negan we bedem de jis de kas namagoshin do dem ni menuendam omayayin. It's a pleasure to be here. Anishinaabe and Dao bungi pegwis and doji. It's a pleasure to share with you the language of the territory. I come to you from. Treaty One territory here in uh, Manitowobo, uh, the place where the uh, life comes from the water and uh, also the place in which the creator sits. And so we're at a beautiful place here in this territory, really the center of Turtle Island. And it's a pleasure to be here and spend a little bit of time with you this evening. Uh, and this very important panel uh, hearing from three great thinkers and speakers and really visionaries of our time. We're very lucky in that we're able to share the space with uh, three very busy people who uh, uh, I've known, uh, some of them I've known for a very long time, some of them I've just met recently, uh, but all of us are dedicated to the issues of Indigenous communities, our own relatives who are living on the streets. And those of us who are experiencing poverty, whether we experienced it growing up or currently, um, I, I, this pandemic has made uh, the situation exponentially more critical that we deal with this issue and uh, we have some visionary leadership in order to address this. And what I've been asked to do before we begin and we get to Leah, Natasha and Leslie is to really situate the issue of Indigenous poverty. And what I wanted to do, I just wanted to show two slides uh, or two images uh, as we begin. Um, part of my work uh, in the city here of Winnipeg uh, in, you know, when I live in Winnipeg is to work with an organization called the Mama Bear Clan. And it's one of many uh, street patrol agencies that we have in the city. Uh, it's start, this organization's run predominantly by grandmothers of the North Point Douglas Women's Center. And what we've been doing ever since the beginning, uh, well, we've been doing for years, approximately five years, but what we've been also doing uh, as, a, as a group uh, for the uh, level of time that I've been involved is we've been dealing directly with uh, street level poverty 
and helping our relatives, the majority, the vast majority, I would say most nights, 100% uh, Indigenous peoples who live on the streets of Winnipeg. Approximately 80% of people who live on the streets of Winnipeg who are experiencing frontline poverty uh, are uh, Indigenous. And then on top of that, not only are they experiencing homelessness, but many of the people who live in tent city or who are otherwise temporarily accommodated uh, people who are in temporary shelters and housing. And so what we do is we go out on the streets and we we provide uh, services that have been historically not offered or that have historically been marginalized throughout Canada's history with our communities and that have driven people into poverty. So it's not that uh, anything has happened where people choose poverty. And I think oftentimes that's what we have to remind our, our uh, non-Indigenous relatives, so also other, other communities throughout the country. Nobody chooses poverty. Um, for Indigenous peoples in particular, we have been driven into poverty and the, the logical outcome of the Indian Act, the residential school system, the incredible amount of land theft that's taken place over the past 150 years is the logical conclusion of poverty. When people are able to escape situations of poverty, it's somewhat of a miracle. And, and it's due to, for the most part, due to the incredible resiliency of our communities. And it's due to organizations like the Mama Bear Clan who go out on the streets and help our relatives. And what we do is we provide four essential services that have been either banned, illegal, or uh, removed in the past. And that's uh, a friendly ear. Uh, we offer some spiritual support, meaning we offer a smudge. Uh, anyone who wants to smudge in the streets, we also, we also offer food for front lines and particularly support the dozen or so tent cities in the downtown core area. And then lastly, and probably far you know, of most importance is we provide support for people to be able to access resources um, because many of our relatives who are driven into poverty, uh, the one thing that they're lacking is opportunity. And uh, evidence of what the situation is involving the pandemic has uh, came out to us in June, where we picked up about 300 needles in the Thunderbird House area, which is in downtown, and we picked them up in about 15 minutes. And poverty, as we've known very well as a community, but uh, poverty added in with the pandemic involves exponential increase in trauma. And so that uh, the way that many of our relatives are coping on the streets is turning to uh, ways, you know, self-medication and trying to cope with the already existing and emergency situation on the streets. And so there's many things that we're going to talk about tonight. Um, and I've, of course, I think I've positioned this as an urban issue, but of course, uh, it's not hard to look at our relatives on First Nations, many of whom um, I come from Peguis First Nation, uh, but all the other First Nations come to mind immediately, uh, Attawapiskat and, and many other First Nations that we've heard about in, in the past, uh, that they are also being driven into poverty. And we're going to hear from uh, people who have both experiencing on uh, poverty on First Nations and also in urban situations. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, pose the question to our three panelists to begin off the night and to ask them to speak a little bit about their own experiences with dealing with poverty on the front lines. And then also what, what would it be defined as an indigenous experience of poverty? And that could be personally from your own experience. That could also be from your experience of being a person in a leadership position throughout the country. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna start off with uh, perhaps the person that I've known the best or the longest is Leah Gazan. So Leah, of course, is an MP uh, in a riding very close to me here. Um, she's a, a person who I've known for a very long time since we were children, since our parents worked together in the front line of activism uh, throughout the country, uh, particularly for Indigenous communities. And so Leah, now, of course, you're not only an MP, you were recently named uh, amongst the Maclean's Magazine 50 Top Most Influential Canadians, <laughs> um, which was remarkable, I mean, because you don't live in Toronto and 90% of that list is <laughs> But, but that being said, um, so <laughs> tell me a little bit about uh, some of the work that you're doing in poverty. Of course, you know, uh, you've, you've worked very hard to try to make a livable wage or guaranteed basic income. So uh, feel free to talk about that. But also, what is it your experience or what would we define as an Indigenous experience of poverty? Well, I think, you know, I, I always talk when I talk about poverty, I always call it the most violent human rights violation. And if you look at the history of Indigenous peoples in this country, our poverty was born out of the wrongful dispossession of lands through acts of violence, acts of violence that continue today. Uh, certainly we see that around resource extraction uh, um, that happens 
primarily around indigenous communities, limiting our ability to uh, thrive and survive off traditional sustenance, traditional food sources, uh, you know, water, access to clean drinking water. But what it's done in urban centers is it's, is it's left us homeless on our very own lands. And, you know, Nigon, I know you spoke of Thunderbird House. Thunderbird House is in fact in, in the riding that I'm very privileged to represent, a riding that's the third poorest riding in the country where 70% of the unsheltered community currently um, is, in, is in fact indigenous. And in fact, over 60% of the current uh, COVID cases in Manitoba um, are, um, or are impacting Indigenous peoples. Uh, and this is not a coincidence. We know that there's a direct correlation uh, between poverty and high rates of, of COVID-19. So it's no, um, it's no, uh, of no surprise that although the numbers, the COVID numbers are going down in Manitoba, that that's not true for all populations. And we know that when you don't provide people what they need, basic human rights, access to housing, access to clean drinking water, whether it's in uh, you know, remote communities or urban centers, you place people at risk. And combined with that, uh, you know, a lot of Indigenous folks that are unsheltered are also pathologized and often blamed for where they are at. So there's a level of classism, but also a level of visceral and violent uh, racism that is used to justify a continuation of violating the human rights of Indigenous peoples across the country and certainly in in the province of Manitoba and nobody wants to look at their own backyard. Certainly we have serious uh, issues that we need to address about the willful and ongoing human rights violations of Indigenous folks, even in the very community that I represent uh, in, in an urban centre. These This discrimination is not um, isolated to communities. It's a lived experience uh, every day for many folks uh, uh, in the uh, city of Winnipeg. In fact, um, it's important to note that prior to uh, Christmas, uh, our shelters uh, that I live right beside, I live right uh, downtown, a uh, couple of blocks down from my house, uh, they had an outbreak of trench fever. Now, trench fever is a disease that is found more commonly in refugee camps and hasn't been seen in Canada for about 100 years. Yet in the city of Winnipeg, uh, as a result of extreme poverty, primarily impacting Indigenous peoples, these kinds of diseases uh, that shouldn't even be seen today uh, are being seen. Yet there's still a continual failure uh, of governments, uh, whether it's the federal government, the provincial government to do what they need to do to ensure that Indigenous peoples in this country are afforded uh, human rights, um, including, although, you know, they put it forward probably at the 11th hour, Bill C-15 to fully adopt and implement the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. They wait and they wait and they wait. And in the midst of it, people are losing their lives. One of the reasons I put forward my private member's motion for a guaranteed livable basic income was to say that we need to change the way we do things in the country. We can't assume that, you know, everybody talks about working, but not everybody can work. People with severe mental health and trauma maybe can't work a full-time job or maybe aren't able to work. People with severe mental health issues, uh, people, adults where 70% of adults with intellectual disabilities um, you know, live in poverty, uh, that we are not up even upholding our Canadian charter by not ensuring that people, no matter where they live on Turtle Island, are afforded housing and clean drinking water. And we have governments that are fighting little kids in court with Cindy Blackstock, a hero of our time, to get the same resources uh, as, as our other children, something um, that um, the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal rules has named 
as deliberately and willfully just racially discriminating against First Nations kids on reserve. So it's violent. Poverty is violent. And keeping people in poverty willfully by this incremental justice that's afforded to Indigenous peoples when it comes to like things like toilets, well, we should consult about it. I don't know many Indigenous people that need to consult about wanting a toilet. Like, it's time to stop. It's time to just ensure people have human rights. Stop making excuses. And if they can spend almost $20 billion on a pipeline to hear from two, Timbuktu with zero profit margin, certainly they can afford to ensure that everybody, including Indigenous peoples on these lands, are afforded basic human rights. So I'll leave it at that. It's a very hot issue for me. It's pretty disgusting. Anyway, I'll leave it at that. I completely, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I, I'm I'm dealing with the issues directly that you're talking about uh, by helping our relatives on the streets. I, I've worked almost 20 years helping people here on the front lines in the streets here, and I can tell you that it's worse than ever. There's uh, no the poverty. We've never had 10 cities in in Winnipeg before. We've never had situations of people sleeping outside minus 50 degrees. Right now, the uh, city of Winnipeg uh, just removed all the doors on bus shelters. Uh, to in, to stop drug use in the bus shelters. And the question should be, why are people using drugs in the bus shelters? It shouldn't be, how do we help them, not how do we hurt them? And that's really ultimately some of the real challenges in terms of uh, talking about poverty. Natasha, I want to turn to you. Um, you know, about a year and a half ago, uh, uh, you co-authored a study with the Assembly of First Nations. You work in policy uh, with the with the Assembly of First Nations. And what your study found studying uh, things like the National Household Survey and the census, uh, that 47% of uh, First Nations children in Canada live in poverty. Uh, do you want to speak a little bit about uh, some of the findings that you had in that report and also talk a little bit about some of the work that uh, what you think would be an Indigenous experience of poverty, but of course you have a much more macro view, a very large view of the country having worked uh, with 640 plus First Nations. Yeah, thanks Nigan. Um, so going back to 2019, when we published the paper in cooperation with the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives, as well as Upstream, which is a think tank on social determinants of health, what we really found was Canada doesn't even have an accurate picture of Indigenous poverty in Canada that it can turn to, to first identify the problem. Before we work on concrete solutions, we really need significant data to be able to understand. And so while, yes, we pointed to 47% of um, First Nations in Canada are living in poverty, that really was using um, just a very minute um, indicator of poverty it was something that we call the low income measure. So it's purely economic alone. And when I think about Leah's comments on poverty, thinking about a contextual approach to understanding, you know, um, well being and the, the holistic um, and social economic compounds of poverty, such as mental health, uh, housing infrastructure, child welfare, education, violence. Um, I think about the the definition of poverty, the, the opposite of that. It's not it's not economic wealth. It's not um, having enough money to have basic necessities. It's it's about prosperity. It's about well-being and wellness. And so thinking about how our ancestors as Indigenous peoples, I'm a member of Beausoleil First Nation, which is in southern Ontario, wanted me to live. It's very much with that prosperous mindset, having enough for not only myself, but my generations coming up. Um, and so going back to the paper that we published, it's disgusting to me that there are over 7 million Canadian children in Canada, of which 18% of them live in poverty, not even Indigenous children, just, just children in Canada. How is, how is we as a society comfortable with the fact that one in five of our children don't potentially have enough food in their stomachs when they go to sleep at night? Um, and so thinking about experiences that I've had at the Assembly of First Nations, you know, we're a national advocacy organization that works on First Nations issues when sheeps give us mandates to do so, we've heard across the board that, that poverty continues to be um, a really important issue. As Canada continues to refine its recent poverty reduction strategy, First Nations have really been left behind in terms of ensuring that there are actually adequate definitions and perspectives on poverty and well-being that incorporate worldviews um, from, you know, coast to coast to coast. And so uh, while our paper didn't really point to solutions to address poverty, really step one is ensuring that we have accurate um, data as defined by First Nations so we be can begin to develop solutions to this problem. 
And, you know, we uh, at the University of Manitoba Department of Native Studies, we've been hosting, we hosted Sid Frankel as one of our presenters uh, who did a study on the National Household Survey and what, what's called the, the market basket measure, which is how the country determines poverty or who gets fit, who fits into poverty. And what this government, which is often given a lot of credit, I think, for being different than the previous federal government, but what this federal government recently did was change the market basket measure so that less people appear in poverty, but haven't addressed the issues of poverty itself. And the market, when the market basket measure, which is basically uh, the price for a, a, a basket of goods that will survive, bread, milk, eggs, uh, some other services and things like that. And the market basket, you know, when you manipulate the market basket measure and you say, well, the price of goods is actually this, therefore there's less people in poverty than we thought, is an exact way that the federal government is able to manipulate the statistics instead of actually dealing with the issue. Um, and Sid Frankel authored a report with the Canadian Centre of Policy Alternatives, uh, uh, who you worked with, a uh, really remarkable report that we were able to uh, um, broadcast that in our Facebook page. But Miigwech Natasha, a uh, fellow Anishinaabe, for doing this kind of work and in particularly advocating for our communities and for, our, for our, our nieces and our nephews who are, you know, many of our relatives, uh, when Cindy Blackstock has come up a few times, Cindy's a good friend of mine, and what Cindy often says is that um, the situation on First Nations the reason why there's so many children in care is because of the chronic underfunding and what Leah called the systemic discrimination of Indigenous families, which naturally evolves into more children in the child welfare system than, than ever before. Um, Leslie, I want to turn to you for, for a, a moment here. I mean, you're out on the West Coast. Uh, you're out in a, a, a territory I'm very familiar with. Out, I believe on, you're on Musqueam, are you not? Yes, I am. Yeah, and uh, and so of course that's also the site of the University of British Columbia, and and mm -hmm. uh, you know I spent a lot of time there, did my graduate work there, but you know I have never seen the kind of poverty that there is in Vancouver. I mean, I often think that the situation in Winnipeg is particularly bad, involving tent city and people sleeping outside in minus fifty degrees, but. You know, the kind of poverty that's in Vancouver is a very specific kind of poverty, and it really targets Indigenous peoples who are in situations of tremendous trauma. And I know that you've worked in areas of uh, murder, missing Indigenous women and girls, and uh, as the executive director of the BC Association of uh, Friendship Centers, you know, I grew up in a friendship center. Uh, the, I know the, the critical work friendship centers do all across, both in small towns um, and also in, in large cities. Uh, what is your experience with Indigenous poverty and what would you define as uh, some of the, what we've been talking about, the impacts of poverty on Indigenous peoples? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Negan. Yeah, um, greetings everybody from beautiful Musqueam First Nation. And as uh, Negan says, if any of you know uh, Vancouver, at all. Musqueam is just on the little corner of <clears throat> the city beside the university uh, and right next door to us is some of the most expensive neighborhoods in Vancouver with three million and up uh, dollar houses. Um, so you can imagine anybody here in BC who is working and I believe our um, our minimum wage went up to $15, $15 an hour or 14, or it's slated to go up to a maximum of $15.20 per hour. I'm not quite sure if it's there yet. Um, nobody can afford housing here. You have to basically inherit your parents' housing now. Um, and uh, for many Indigenous people uh, across BC and certainly across Canada and, and actually even North America, um, we end up in the downtown east side. I have many relations in the downtown east side of Vancouver, where um, in the last uh, homelessness count, there were 711 Indigenous people who were homeless in Vancouver. That's not including Surrey. There's an additional number of Indigenous people who are homeless in Surrey, which is a suburb of Vancouver. Um, we make up 33% of the homeless population in Vancouver, uh, in Greater Vancouver, and we only make up 2.5% of the Indigenous population. So going back to Leah's comments again, um, you know, when I, I, I work in this area, and certainly there has been a poverty reduction strategy in BC, but what I find um, in adding to your comments, Leah, is that uh, often we're asked to manage our oppression. <laughs> um, we're not asked, we're not being offered enough support to actually overcome it, but we're asked to manage it. And sometimes we get some small supports for it. When you look at the downtown east side 
Uh, there has been a commitment to housing now in the downtown east side and we have, um, I think there's probably 50 less indigenous or less homeless people than there were last year. Um, so we have to say something there, the province is making a commitment to poverty reduction. And I want to acknowledge um, two of our ministers who in BC who have led that, Minister Shane Simpson and Minister Melanie Mark. Both of those are elected ministers who grew up in poverty in the downtown east side. And I think that their um, understanding and analysis of poverty was so strong. Um, and that led us to working on a poverty reduction strategy in BC. So uh, kudos to those politicians to, you know, vote for Indigenous politicians because they're making, you know, important changes. Um, so, yeah, the downtown east side is still, um, you know, there's been, uh, especially during COVID, there was a lack of services, there was food insecurity, we came very highlighted. Um, we not only have the uh, COVID problem right now, but we have had since about 2010, we've, uh, it's been declared a crisis in the downtown east side, the um, illegal um, drug use of fentanyl. Um, and particularly since the borders have been closed, dirty fentanyl, which has been sort of made here or somewhere in BC and uh, trafficked. And we've had, I believe, over 6,000 deaths uh, related to fentanyl. Um, and um, many, many of those are in the downtown east side. It is a particularly unsafe for Indigenous women who are experiencing poverty. And many Indigenous women are fleeing um, you know, reserve communities um, for, you know, for violence or, you know, that violence that they've experienced growing up or violence as a woman in an intimate relationship. And the downtown east side is particularly dangerous for them. We've seen during COVID where one woman was being openly sexually assaulted on the street, on the major street corner of the downtown east side. Another woman gave birth in a porta potty and um, the infant was found, it, it did not survive. I mean, there are so many horrific stories about women in the downtown east side and the lack of safety. I believe only 40% of the downtown east side are, are women, but it is, it is such an unsafe place for all of us. Um, and any of you who, um, who have ever gone into the downtown east side, they, they're actually, um, at some point, some of the tourism companies were marketing poverty tourism. And this is Canada. I remind you, this is our great Canadian country. You know, we're one of the big G7 countries, but we have horrific poverty here in Vancouver. We have um, tent cities that have been moving. They've been uh, moved out of one place and they get shut down um, and they get violently shut down, you know, where the police come and take all of their items away, all of their shopping cart collected um, things their possessions and take those away and move them um, and they get just get moved around and they've started up another one and um, and then it's in a new neighborhood and the people are really concerned in that neighborhood about the theft that's going up so um, we haven't really addressed I mean I, although we're starting to work on the poverty reduction strategy and there are some uh, important pieces of work that are happening within this strategy we're not seeing very many at this point very many um, successes. I also want to point out that I'm on the board of Central City Foundation, which resides our home our, is in the downtown east side, and we invest in social purpose real estate. And one of the buildings that we have, we own currently now, which is an SRO, a single room occupancy hotel, we're turning it into a, um, we're redeveloping it, and we are committing to developing this um, building, rebuilding it for Indigenous women-led families because we really recognize in BC that indigenous women homelessness is a nasty awful problem and so that is our commitment with Central City Foundation to try to address that. You watch for that Leslie and you, there's so many different uh, jumping off points for uh, that and thinking about um, I kind of want to pose this to all three of you um, but I also want to, before I pose a question to the three of you, and, and we can kind of tackle it, because I think it's the it's the key to poverty, the key to the solution of poverty. Um, but before I do that, I want to say that the uh, everyone who's, uh, you know, we've got a hundred and some plus people um, in the uh, watching this right now. And of course, we're recording this, it will be uploaded later by the Tamarck Institute. 
Um, and so uh, if you have a question, please put it in the chat. Um, I'm going to turn to the questions uh, soon enough. We have about half an hour left of our discussion here. Um, uh, and so, you know, feel free to put in the chat. But before, you know, I want to ask my sort of question, and it's something also that the organizers have uh, have posed it when we met earlier in the week and we were talking about what are we going to talk about for tonight. It was something that came up time and time again. The hardest thing I think for people, for Canadians to understand about, uh, and I would say this about maybe all poverty, but particularly Indigenous poverty, is that uh, while shelters is, are important, they're not the solution. Uh, while housing even is important, it's also not the solution. Uh, you can provide shelter, housing, food, and if people don't feel good about themselves, if they don't have good mental health, if they aren't able to capably deal with the issues of trauma from colonization, from the violence and racism that lives within Canadian society, from the fact that to be an Indigenous person is to be seen as a second tier deficient, uh, less than human being, um, if we don't deal with the issues of systemic racism in Canada, then all of those things are almost working uh, counteractive to the broader issues around attitudes around Indigenous peoples. And so um, what uh, I work with a councillor, city councillor, Vivian Santos, and I know Leah, you work a lot with Vivian as well. Um, one of the things that we've tried very hard, uh, in, and I've, I've rallied Vivian to do this in city council, is that while shelters are important, if we don't provide mental health services and particularly cultural support services for those of our relatives on the streets, if they don't have a purpose and a meaning and to be able to heal from the issues of systemic racism in their lives, then frankly, they're gonna keep on the streets. And that's why Tent City is safer than in the shelters because in Tent City, at least there's a community and there's people who care about you and there's people who look after you. And that's why uh, I think Canadians generally don't understand that about Indigenous poverty, is that if we don't deal with the issues of cultural safety, mental well-being, and the issues of, of seeking a community and healing from this horrible violence and genocide of colonialism for the past 150 years, then poverty will persist and it will be an Indigenous challenge because of that ongoing issue. Now, I don't know what you think about uh, some of that and the various work that you do in areas. Uh, Leah, do you want to start off? Well, I think I, I, this makes me think of um, We Are All Children, the documentary that came out around the TRC, and there was uh, an elder uh, in that documentary, and, and she said something so profound, and I, it, it stuck to me. She said, the greatest poverty of all is poverty of the spirit. Uh, you know, people on the, like, on the streets, uh, certain story I, it, that really touches my heart very deeply. Uh, that's deep pain. Uh, that is deep trauma. I can't imagine the kind of agony that so many people are in. That's deep with no support. You know, uh, kindness is really powerful. And and although. Um, you know, we we talk about laws and policies, that's important, but it has to be, policies also have to be framed within kind, kindness. Uh, you know, I, I often uh, talk about human rights, I've spent my life fighting around human rights, but what, they, what they've done through this genocide is they've violated our right to joy. And when you don't provide people what they need, basic human rights, uh, love and care and support, you strip people of their right to joy. And that's what providing human rights are. It's providing people with the right to joy, to live who they are, where they are, with the kinds of supports that they uh, need to flourish and be, be joyful. And so a lot of the work that I'm trying to do uh, in, in, in my writing, I think you're, you know, so right, Negon, is to meet people where they're at in non-judgment. Uh, you know, to have low barrier housing. Uh, we finally, after nine years, the community fought for a 24 safe space for women, girls, 2SLGBTQQIA folks, low barrier, uh, meeting people where they're at with supports, 
we're looking at housing projects now in Winnipeg, and I think Winnipeg has a long way to go. Like I really look to places like like Toronto and, and Vancouver. I know we made a joke, but you know, my mom, when she in the 60s was working in the downtown east side as a psychiatric nurse, uh, providing low barrier care to people who were addicted to drugs. We're still having these these discussions in Winnipeg is about whether this is appropriate care or not. Um, many people, um, you know, as we know, that are unsheltered are suffering from severe mental health issues and require support of uh, living so that they can be successful. Um, so I just, I, I just feel like we, we have a long, long way to go. But here's the thing. When you, like in the Indian Act, when you see somebody as not human, then you can justify the most unjustifiable acts. And I think if there's anything Indigenous people uh, have had to fight for in this country is being seen as human beings worthy of respect, human rights, love and kindness, and dignity. And unfortunately, in the House of Commons, which is a very violent colonial environment, our human rights are up for debate, human rights that many Canadians take for granted every single day. We need to change that. We need to change that. So I'll just leave it there. Natasha, you know, when we're working on the streets here in the city, um, the two communities that we encounter the most are Kid are, are about 19, 20 year olds who are just coming out of the child welfare system. By far the majority of people who I meet on the streets are people who are chronically living on the streets because they've come out of the child welfare system. And frankly, some of the horrific things that they've had to go through during that time in the system. And then the second group of people, and it's pretty remarkable, it's the most amount of Ojibwe and Cree in a, here in a week, are people who are on the streets who are residential school survivors and they are living I mean, these are our relatives. These are our grandparents, our, our uncles and aunties who are living on the streets, oftentimes a very food, a very hand to mouth situation, many of them living, uh, you know, in very dire circumstances. It, it is remarkable to me how many residential school survivors uh, still today are living on the streets uh, right here in the city of Winnipeg. In your work and looking with children particularly, um, do you see some of the ties between the child welfare system? And then is there, uh, is there ways that you've seen connections or uh, ways that that's been addressed by the assembly or by some of the work that you know within government or? Yeah, definitely. Um, if you look at the paper, one of the choices that we had as, as authors was to include um, photographs of strong First Nations families and children particularly throughout the document because this was really a paper that focused on a, a deficit lens to poverty, when we know there are tons of strong, capable family units, um, you know, being raised by, by strong First Nations parents myself, um, I'm, I'm very privileged to um, be able to be in this leadership position as I know the other panelists are, because this is a really difficult topic. Um, there is definitely a link between children who are in the foster care system or through child welfare that then um, find themselves through no fault of their own being completely left and abandoned and not having any traditional services to to um, you know establish themselves as adults. I have friends that went through the system and you know when they left they didn't have a, a SID number set up. They weren't able to have a bank account um, to be able to participate as a member of society. And so there is a connection between uh, poverty, homelessness, and, and being involved in the child welfare system. And it's something that you know the Assembly of First Nations has been working on for some time with recent legislation on Bill C-92. Um, but more broadly, relating back to the work that I do at the Assembly of First Nations, primarily on fiscal relationships and self-governance, it's really, you know, the solution lies in ensuring that First Nations are part of these collective decisions and that we develop solutions based on our own Indigenous values and our own circumstances. Um, and ultimately, that's that's about self-government and self-determination. And so th those are the broader policy perspectives that we're developing here at the Assembly of First Nations is, is ensuring that the right the right contexts are set up so that First Nations can design their own systems. We no longer have to be, as Leslie said, administrators of our own poverty, but we can instead ensure that we can design and, and establish our own systems of prosperity. And so I'm thinking of a First Nation like Member Two. Member Two First Nation, you know, 20 years ago, they had 37 employees. 
And now, you know, they've just purchased a $25 million um, license to, to fish with clear water. They, they went from like a $4 million budget to a $65 million budget. And that's through their own decision to, to enact their own self-government and self-determination. And so um, from that fiscal perspective, it's really about taking back control over our own, our own systems, our own policies and programs and ensuring that um, we have actors like the House of Commons um, like, you know, the, the National Association of Friendship Centers and the work that Leslie's doing out in BC, um, because it really, it really does take all sorts. I, I know that uh, one of the issues that we have in terms of, of even beginning to address the, the is issue of poverty and homelessness is that our people move back and forth from off reserve to on reserve all of the time, because there is a lack of opportunity, because there's a lack of employment, a lack of adequate housing. And so it really will take solutions designed by both urban and and on reserve um, programs and policies to be able to begin to address this problem i mean leslie we've got uh we've got a real challenge in terms of giving hope right and natasha's talking i think about our communities our leadership giving our own people hope and uh i can think of no more hopeful places frankly than friendship centers uh, like I told you before, I grew up in a friendship center. I was in the daycare. My, mm. my uncle was the executive director of the friendship center in Selkirk. Uh, my dad was the bingo caller. Like that's how close we were to the friendship center. And I can tell you that the friendship center did more for me than give me just a place, a safe place to be. It gave me hope. It gave me opportunity and it gave me positive relationships with uh, other Indigenous peoples, non-Indigenous peoples as well, but it gave me a sense of pride in myself because every day I walked in, I can tell you, I saw the feather, I smelt the smudge, I had the smudge nearby, I had people who loved me, everyone called me nephew, everyone called me auntie, it was like being in this family, and even when my uh, parents' relationship broke down, and uh, they, you know, I admit for a few years, there was a lot of stress in my family. We were on welfare for a long time. Uh, you know, I always had a home at the Friendship Center. Anytime I went there, I always knew that I had someone to care for me. Um, is That's the kind of the things that I've taken in, in my work with on the streets. Right now, I'm caring for one of my former students who's addicted to meth and, and trying to care for him and support him as he's trying to get his life back on track. Uh, what are some ways that you've seen in friendship centers and of course, maybe some other experiences that you've had success stories of dealing with frontline poverty? Uh, and I know, of course, you've also worked with government as well. Yes, um, thanks for sharing that story. And again, we hear that so many times about friendship center babies and many of the people who are leading working in friendship centers across the country or friendship center babies grew up in friendship centers. So um, we know that this, this works. We know that friendship centers work uh, they work particularly well for Indigenous people, they work for their urban and off-reserve population, and that's how friendship centers were started when people were looking for other Indigenous people to be around because we feel safe around each other, and we're always, always dealing with racism. One of the uh, areas of hope that I have for friendship centers is not just in the service delivery that we're doing now, and every single friendship center across the country has rafted together these small pots of funding in order to create something to deliver in a in 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 a worldview that has uh, an indigenous perspective to it to to the degree that our funders allow us to do that. So we try to do um, a holistic approach. We try to make sure that every door is the right door. If you walk into a friendship center and you've got six areas of need, we try to be the, the, the agency that supports all those six areas of need. But it's not easy. The majority of funding, our poverty is a billion dollar industry in this country. And we have many, many non-Indigenous agencies who are uh, making it their business to serve our poverty. And in BC, one of the areas that I'm really working on is working with the um, poverty reduction um, leadership in this province and the social service sector to try to bring that back in house, to try to, well, it was never in house. It's always been out there led by mainstream organizations and slowly trying to address those issues. You know, um, mental health is basically very little mental health services available to indigenous people in BC from an indigenous worldview and perspective. And that is so important because we have a completely different worldview, as you well know, on, on mental health issues. 
uh, violence against Indigenous women and girls. For the most part, we have some services in our centres, but often they're two and three year contracts and not long standing. We don't have all the transition houses or all the second stage housing uh, and we don't have the counseling services. Those are outside of our community for the most part. And we are trying to provide that. We know that we have a huge success model. We know that indigenous people feel safe with us. And so we're working with our, our ally mainstream agencies to try to, you know, to ask them to work with us to bring those services back into uh, into Indigenous community. That's the hope that I have, is that we will be able to provide all of those services to, to all of our uh, people. And in addition, the, the subsidiary services that uh, are provided to Indigenous people, like just in childcare alone, just in, in child welfare, for example, there's huge amounts of, of um, of uh, opportunities for uh, employment and training, for procurement, op these kinds of opportunities that we have very little access to in Indigenous community. And um, one of the areas that I'm trying to do is uh, trying to work on is working with Indigenous youth and entrepreneurship to help them understand that they have some opportunities out there that no one has ever accessed. Procurement is there's very few Indigenous service procurement providers in, in, in our province and across Canada, and we need to fix that too. So I have hope that we're going to move all of these issues forward very quickly in the next 10 years. I've got, uh, I, I want to talk about friendship centers all day, frankly, only, I mean, just because I'm so frustrated with the fact that the Winnipeg Friendship Center, one of the oldest in the country, uh, has gone completely uh, awry and because for the most part of um, a uh, lack of funding is I would say the number one issue there's also some issues around governance of the center itself and it just it is just remarkable to me how quickly things unraveled uh, when you have a government that's uh, frankly doesn't care about the center doesn't support the center doesn't realize the important work of the center uh, provincial and federal I mean that just really just lies I would even add the civic government here in the city is is just letting that place go uh, anyways so I don't want to get into the situation of the Winnipeg Friendship Center but um, I have three direct questions uh, one for each of you so I'm going to go as quickly as I can uh, we have about 13 minutes these are from viewers um, who are watching right now and they've put it in the chat so I'm going to ask you directly um, the first is to you, Leah, uh, there's a question asking about what is the role of uh, post-secondary institution or educational institutions in uh, tackling issues of poverty? Uh, how are ways that educational institutions, I'm thinking universities, the way the question was asked, uh, how do universities deal with the issues of poverty in a non-simplistic way, which is the way that the, uh, the per, uh, this is from Faith Jones. So. Well, I, I know we're coming to an end, so I'm going to just say that it's just been such a privilege being on the panel with uh, Leslie and Natasha and my good brother, uh, Negon, uh, just to be with other women around the country and, and of course, my brother. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Me gone, but uh, that are that are really trying to push push for a change and you know a better better world for everybody, including our brothers and sisters, you know, and. Um, so I, I, full disclosure, I'm a recovering academic. I uh, taught in the Faculty of ed Education uh, prior to to being elected for for a number of years, and I think you know it has to go beyond. I mean, we've done some really great things uh, in in Manitoba. Certainly, uh, access programs are an example of that. KTEP, a program geared to training Indigenous uh, folks. Uh, to become teachers uh, in in the school while they work in in school, so fully employed. But I think it's also about land and space. You know, universities, particularly in downtown Winnipeg. If we're gonna, I mean, there's, I mean, this is a huge question. But I think because we're talking about being unsheltered, it has to do about land, and dispossession of land and space. And I think as universities uh, take up space, particularly in, in urban environments, that they have to share the space. Uh, the University of Winnipeg has certainly had some really strong initiatives around a building, uh, being um, involved in, in uh, establishing affordable uh, housing for students, but also uh, the community at large. And I think, you know, if we take up space, uh, we also have to share space. 
uh, and acknowledge whose space it is. And when I look at the number of uh, Indigenous brothers and, and sisters that are uh, living unsheltered uh, right now, right beside the University of Winnipeg, um, where you know we see uh, increasing rates of um, drug use just as a way to medicate life, you know, no, not here to judge. I don't know their story. Uh, important that we also have to share space and uh, and share that privilege. You know, universities uh, historically have been uh, institutions that were established for the elite. And uh, institutions, post-secondary institutions, are the ones that are responsible uh, to train policymakers, lawyers, doctors, uh, people who become elected officials. We need to do our part. I'm sorry, I'm talking past. I think uh, post-secondary uh, institutions need to do their part to educate people on the true history of the country. Uh, to truly understand where their privilege, even to sit in a university for many people comes from, and that's from the backs of indigenous people and the dispossession of lands of indigenous people that have allowed such privilege for some in this country, but also in a sharing of space and to ensure when people take up space, that that space is shared to make sure that everybody benefits. And, you know, I, I really do commend the University of Winnipeg. I think they've done some good work. I know that they're always pushing to advance that. Um, and it really speaks to how hopeful uh, it could be with post-secondary institutions doing their part to address this grotesque human rights violation. And that's violent poverty, the violent act of poverty on groups which has been um, primarily or in the large part in terms statistically uh, impacted Indigenous peoples throughout uh, the country. So I'll leave it at there. The key is, is to teach uh, and help people understand that Indigenous success means the success of all people related to Indigenous communities. And I think that's part of it is what you're talking about there. Natasha, your direct question uh, from a viewer here has to do with data collection. Uh, what are the ways in which some of the challenges around using data, getting appropriate data, using data to support claims? Um, I know that sounds like a pretty open question, but um, as someone who's a policy analyst, I'm sure that you have lots to say on the ways in which data can be easily manipulated as well. Um, is there a possibility here of the ways that maybe data collection around poverty is problematic or do you see some solutions? Yeah, so at the Assembly of First Nations, they're currently undertaking a review of current poverty indicators. And as we talked about earlier this evening, they're really inadequate. And so um, going back to, to Leah's comments on the first question, what, what those attending this webinar can do is continue to support uh, First Nations initiatives that are working on poverty reduction. Um, you know, visit those spaces, maybe not right now with COVID, but in the future, you know, visit those friendship centers, support those friendship centers, um, go and watch a, an AFN General Assembly to understand what the real issues are. Um, you know, there's no way that we can cover this in, in a half, an hour webinar. Um, from a data perspective, I will say that it's something that's going to take time. First Nations really lack the institutional capacity to design their own data systems currently. We have, we're lucky enough to have the First Nations Information Governance Center, which is really advocating for data sovereignty and, and data governance in the future. But really, I think the, the final outcome is First Nations being, being in control of their own data sets, keeping in mind um, something is, is important, which is the principles of OCAP, so ownership, control, access, and possession. We really need to be in control of our own data what COVID has shown us is that um, desegregated data on Indigenous peoples is really important to be able to design and deliver policies and programs that benefit us. Um, so my hope is that as, as you know, as the poverty reduction strategy continues to be unrolled out by Canada, uh, First Nations are given um, additional opportunities to begin to design their own um, poverty strategies, design their own data systems to actually access timely information that doesn't rely on the census or statistics Canada 
because as we know, not all First Nations actually feel comfortable participating in these systems. And so it's really about transferring the ownership uh, and responsibilities around data to First Nations. Yeah, it's remarkable how data, I mean, just you just have to look at Manitoba in the COVID response. Um, when First Nations control the own, their data of who's who got the sickness, how they got the sickness, and they're in cooperation with provincial legislature, which has the infrastructure to do that, but then First Nations control that data, then First Nations come up with the solutions, and no surprise, uh, we get Pegwis over Christmas, my community eliminated the virus eliminated the virus in the community of a community of several thousand people where they were having outbreaks like crazy and they eliminated it. I mean, that's a brilliant, perfect example of First Nations control of data is the solutions. Uh, Leslie, your question is, uh, and, and I think this is the kind of often question that we get as when we get a bunch of Indigenous peoples in a room and we do a webinar like this, we get, so this is the mandatory question. You got the question for this time around is uh, we're being asked uh, what can non-Indigenous peoples look uh, in a situation that is sometimes uh, feeling very helpless, uh, particularly when it comes to Indigenous poverty? Uh, they don't want to be stepping on anyone's sovereignty, as Natasha has been pointing out, but they also want to be good allies. Uh, do you have some advice for non-Indigenous peoples looking at this issue and saying, how can I be supportive in the best way? Okay, can I give an example of... Um... Uh, an issue that cropped up during COVID. Of course, COVID um, showed us the cracks in this country and the people in poverty and, uh, and created um, chasms. So one of the issues that happened during COVID was that uh, going back to violence against women and girls is that um, there was, uh, because people were isolated uh, and couldn't leave their homes uh, during the shutdown, um, and the service provider agencies, the mainstream service provider agencies, for the most part, shut down for anywhere up to uh, eight weeks. Um, Indigenous women, which are the women that I'm concerned about, had nowhere to go. Um, and so um, I called up my colleagues at Vancouver's Battered Women Support Services, led by Angela Marie McDougall, and said, can you help? And they said, yes, of course, we can help. They stepped up their crisis line to 24 hours a day. Uh, Angela herself was on the midnight to 8 a.m. shift doing um, indigenous, um, a lot of indigenous crisis uh, support for women who were experiencing uh, domestic violence. Um, and so this is an organization that is a mainstream organization. It actually has a, um, a commitment to decolonizing anti-racism and anti-oppression. It has that within its constitution. It has a majority of indigenous um, women board members on the board, and it has an indigenous um, department and it stepped up and offered. Now compare and contrast that to some mainstream organizations that say, well, yes, we want you to give some anti-violence um, money and training, and yes, you should be doing it all on your own, but you don't have any expertise and you don't have any background and you particularly need some trauma-informed care. I mean, that's those kinds of statements make my blood boil and I'm sure any other indigenous women. I mean, I think that we know trauma. I think we know how to do it. <laughs> and so um, and so compare and contrast that is, you know, Angela Marie McDougall is being a good ally uh, by saying, OK, how can we help? And yes, we will help. Um, and so we've asked them to help to step up our training needs in BC so that indigenous led uh, agencies can take over violence against women services. That is a clear example of how to be a good ally versus not being a good ally. I sat on another board of a downtown east side organization that was women serving and it had 85 to 90 percent indigenous uh, clientele. One token board member, me, and it had an indigenous program but the indigenous program was off-site in another building, a small, tiny Indigenous program off-site. And I pointed out the obvious. You have 85% Indigenous people here. Why doesn't this place look Indigenous? It looks mainstream. And why doesn't? Why don't you have uh, Indigenous programming as the majority of your programming? And they said, oh, no, 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 no. We want to keep this neutral so that everybody feels welcome. And the Indigenous programming is very special, and we had to get some special funding for it, and so it is off-site. So that's how not to be a good ally. And I, I, I think it's really helpful to have some really concrete examples, and I just want to share that with you. 
you know, uh, that's a great segue to uh, our sort of our final round here. Um, uh, there is a, uh, a few questions and comments I invite people to uh, continue to post in the chat. I notice people are starting to talk with each other, uh, which is fantastic, particularly around the issue of data that Natasha brought up involving the way data can also be misrepresented and, and often used in a very racist means. So thanks to, I believe his name was Tristan for that. Thanks for posting. Um, a, uh, Leah, or actually everyone, I'm going to give everyone just one last opportunity as a wrap up. Uh, Leah, you get double duty though this time because we do have a we we have somebody uh, Barry who's asking he wants to know just where can I go to find out more about your guaranteed livable income bill. So if you could just tell people about you know where that could be located online. But what I'm asking all of you to do at the end is one thing that gives you hope, uh, one thing that you see as a possibility for change, or one example that you've seen as a possibility. Leslie, you've already beaten me to it, so maybe you could. Uh, but you get the last person there. You get the last round when we talk about it. So let's start with Leah. One thing that you get that gives you hope in talking about poverty, uh, and then also don't forget to talk about the livable income bill that you left. Well, I think it's the movement. You know, I, I mean, COVID. I think you know, as as Leslie pointed out, has certainly um, you know put brought to light the the people who are left behind or even further left behind with COVID, we we know that. But I think there's a greater awareness of it. And I certainly know uh, in Winnipeg Centre, I, I don't think it's just true to Winnipeg Centre, although I think we are a very special community. I know it's also true for um, East, East Vancouver, where my good uh, colleague Jenny Kwan uh, has been a, a longtime MP, um, that uh, people want to see uh, People uh, live with human rights in this country. I mean, there's so much support from Indigenous and non-Indigenous people to uh, put in place the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, recognizing that, you know, Indigenous people haven't had uh, human rights. There's, you know, non-Indigenous folks as well putting their bodies on, on the front lines of resource extraction, often concerned about uh, you know, higher rates of violence against Indigenous women and girls, and a younger generation of Indigenous uh, youth that know who they are, are educated, are fierce, speak their truth, and are rising uh, across the country. And, uh, you know, that makes me feel really hopeful. That makes me really hopeful. The movement makes me feel hopeful. I just wanted to add one comment. I know we're ending, but I think the other thing post-secondary institutions can do, and, and Natasha, I'm embarrassed I didn't even say this as a longtime academic, is that like we're not research subjects, uh, you know, to share the research and give ownership to Indigenous folks of research. We need to change that culture of universities. And we need to give um, rights to uh, data or any kind of research to the very people who are giving that information. So I just wanted to, to say that and awesome work, Natasha, on uh, on research. Excellent work, thanks so much. Yeah, and uh, miigwech to, I believe it's Rute who put the uh, leahgazan.ca uh, basic income link on there. If you wanna learn about more about um, the basic income bill that Leah has proposed. Um, Natasha, uh, quickly, we've only got a few minutes left here. Uh, one thing that gives you hope, uh, and then one, maybe one thing that you've uh, that you're hope that you're hopeful for. Thanks, Nigan. Yeah, I would second Leah's comments about youth. Um, I'm very privileged to be able to work with um, First Nations youth from across Canada who are really passionate and totally aware of the issues. Just completely um, experts in their own rights at such a young age. Um, I know I look young, but I. Uh, I'm no longer considered a youth, as I found out today when I went to apply for a, a program. Uh, um, all that to say, uh, you know, with the theme of self-governance and self-determination, I'm really excited as our nations continue to reconceptualize what it means to be a nation and begin to take back that power as we transition out of the Indian Act. I think about my own community, uh, Beausoleil is an island, Gichichimnissing, and so COVID has really put a... Um, a, a literal border on on members that live on the island and those that that um, reside off. And so there's been so many solutions and so much support from community members who who live on the island and those that live on the other side in terms of um, developing relationships with um, local farmers to ensure that food sovereignty um, is under control. 
you know, um, we have drones that are developing medical, uh, delivering medical supplies on a daily basis. Um, you know, First Nations have really, really understood that they need to take back their power of, over uh, handling this pandemic, which we've done before. First Nations are not strangers to pandemics. We were really um, hit in 1918 by, by the flu. And so um, what this has shown me is that we don't even need permission to be doing this. We can just do this ourselves. And for those that um, are here as, as allies and advocates, I would um, really encourage you to support those more grassroots initiatives, um, including you know initiatives that are, are more national at the national level, like what's happening at the Assembly of First Nations. But um, I really thank you for this discussion. Um, I'm more, you know, reminded once again, just how, how united we are from coast to coast to coast on this issue. Natasha, I love that you were saying we don't need permission to do this. Uh, during the uh, pandemic, uh, First Nations were setting up check stops for their own communities. And uh, I can't, you know, I wrote about them for the Winnipeg Free Press and how important they were and how it's really, that's what sovereignty looks like, is when communities stand up and protect their own. But then here's the amazing thing. Um, I got a call from a reader who regularly hates me and a non-Indigenous person who uh, uh, just, you know, says a lot of things about my columns, writes me a lot of emails. But then when he called me, he called me and he said, I just want to tell you that I was really mad because I couldn't access my cottage. And then I realized that First Nations were saving everybody by doing that work. And, and the most amazing thing is, is that that person realized that sovereignty, Indigenous sovereignty, was enacting the safety of everyone. And I think that that was a very, like, it was a proud moment for me. It gave me a lot of hope because uh, this person really didn't get it for a long time about what I was talking about when I talk about Indigenous communities standing up for themselves. And then most importantly, I mean, when we're, people are putting up check stops, they're not just supporting their own community, they're also supporting everybody in the North. And they're caring for everybody, including every single non-Indigenous person who lives there as well. And that's what the beautiful thing that I wanted to, uh, to, to talk to you uh, as you said that. Leslie, uh, you get the final word tonight, um, which I can't think of anyone uh, who talks with more grace and power out in the, uh -huh. the beautiful territory that you're from. Uh, but can you, uh, you know, give us some hope of what you were seeing on this? You just did speak about some programs and some allyship that you saw. But what is some hope that you're seeing in terms of dealing with Indigenous poverty? Well, I'm a coastal girl. I'm Niska from uh, northwestern BC, just below Alaska. And I have hope for this province. The province is talking about developing a, um, a uh, strategy for the coast, a coastal strategy for the first time. And so many of our Indigenous people have been uh, pushed into poverty who were uh, commercial fishers, who worked in the uh, salmon industry. Um, and uh, of course, the entire industry was grossly mismanaged um, for many, many years, as it was in the East Coast as well. Uh, and so I have some hope, you know, that's, that's what we have done for thousands and thousands of years. And I have hope that we're going to save that industry and bring it back. Um, and so I'm really, uh, I feel very hopeful with this new government and the direction that they're going in. And uh, I think it is, you know, they've um, signed off on DRIPA. Um, and I think they have some commitments and I hope that we are able to demonstrate for the rest of the country that um, working with Indigenous people instead of working against us is, is uh, going to benefit everybody. Everybody wins if we're addressing Indigenous poverty. And that's a great way to end off the, the night. I want to say miigwech, uh, a huge giche miigwech to Leah, to Natasha, to Leslie. Uh, my new cousins across the country, although Leslie, uh, sorry, uh, Leah, sorry, I've known you for so long that we're, uh, I mean, we've been known each other for almost, you know, more than 40 years. And so uh, miigwech to Natasha and Leslie for coming in and, and supporting and uh, particularly a huge thank to the Tamark Institute for staging this dialogue. Uh, I understand that it will be uploaded. Um, it'll also, the, some of the uh, notes will be provided for the public, for those who, uh, who weren't able to join us for tonight. I'm going to hand it back to Elle, uh, who's our original person who started off the night from the Tamark Institute, who's going to close us off. So go ahead, Elle. 
Thank you. Thank you, Negan. And thank you so much to all our uh, speakers today. Um, really fantastic uh, conversation. And there's so much more that we can talk about. I think there's so much more we can pick up on and uh, delve deeply into. But we really appreciate you uh, bringing us into this conversation and helping to deepen it um, and help us to think about poverty in a very holistic way and how we can really tackle tackle poverty poverty together um, and walk alongside to do that um, we uh, we will be sharing these uh, resources any resources and links that were shared uh, in the conversation in the chat box today anything that was mentioned by speakers we will be following up with those links along with a recording of today's session um, and we'll be doing that in the next couple of days. But I'd like to thank all of you once again. Thank you to all the participants for joining us today. Um, and we hope you all have a good rest of your evening or afternoon. Thank you so much.